Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here uh, this morning. Uh, today I uh, we have a very uh, special guest, especially very close to my heart. Uh, I'm originally from from Mexico. I grew up in the border, and there is a a college in the border area that about eight years ago I had a chance to meet uh, one of uh, a professor of engineering there. Uh, even though I did not take class with him directly, a good friend of mine uh, was a student of him, an, an apprentice, and uh, through him I got to know uh, Professor Cardenas Garcia. Uh, he is retired now, so when I asked him how, what, what should I highlight and what I shouldn't, he said, well, mention that I'm retired, but people sometimes take it different ways. Uh, uh, but the, the, the part that I mentioned is he had a long career in mechanical engineer, uh, he has his uh, master's of engineering, his, uh, uh, his undergraduate and his doctorate from the University of Maryland at, at College Park. And he has over 150 publications in mechanical engineer. After that, uh, he moved to the United States uh, Patents and Trademark Office. And in the last couple of years, he has uh, kind of explored uh, some of the interests uh, uh, during the last few days that we interacted with him, we got to know that this is kind of one of his true passions. That is one of those things that you said, hey, when when you have the time and you don't have kind of the expectations of, of what you ought to be doing, uh, what are the things you want to do with, with your life? And for him, his intellectual curiosity uh, was exploring the topic that he will uncover today. Uh, his main objective when he wanted to come to Google, I told him a little bit about our culture of tech talks and the wide range of topics that, that are presented at Google. And I encourage him to, to, uh, to, uh, to come and present here. Uh, and and uh, the main objective today is, is for all of you uh, to get feedback, to ask the hard questions. And I think uh, he is looking forward to that type of feedback and intellectual stimulation and, and conversation. So officially, the, the talk will go maybe for about 30 to 35 minutes, and there will be Q&A. But, but please feel free. Uh, I will have a mic if you have questions throughout the, throughout the talk. And we'll pass it around as this talk is being recorded. Uh, so just raise your hand. I'll pass on the mic. But again, feel free and, and encourage to if you have any questions or any any sort of feedback to, to engage in the in the conversation. Uh, the topic itself is about uh, information and what information is at a very fundamental level. Uh, the the quote that Professor uh, Cardinal Garcia brings is uh, from somebody else is information is the difference that makes a difference. Uh, but I don't want to kind of uh, steal his thunder. Uh, so please uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Jaime Cardenas Garcia. It's uh, uh, great to be here and uh, address uh, <laughs> this uh, select audience. Um, in terms of an outline, uh, I'll go through a, an introduction, which will introduce uh, a lot of the things in information. And then I'll look at the organism and the environment, and that uh, allows for two things. One is how is cognition generated in an organism? And then also what, what does information have to do with that uh, organism? Um, and again, you know, everyone talks about the information age. And of course, uh, this is the place where uh, information is uh, looked at in, in great detail. Uh, you know, information shapes uh, human society. Um, and then, of course, as time has gone on, different uh, things have happened in terms of technology that have furthered, uh, the, I, I guess, the, the spread of information. Uh, information, whether good, accidentally wrong, or deliberately, fa deliberately false, whether educational, artistic, entertaining, or erotic, has become a trillion dollar business. So it's important. Information is encoded, transformed, censored, classified, securely preserved, or destroyed. Information can lead nations to prosperity or into poverty, create and sustain life, or destroy it. Information processes power, distinguish us humans from our ancestor primates and other animals. Uh, and then information processing machines are getting faster, cheaper, better, smaller. Uh, yet, uh, I guess in a sense, uh, we are the, the most exquisite information processing machine. Um, our own 
Self-consciousness, without which we would not be humans, involves an interplay in real time of information from the past, from the present, and about the future. Um, an interplay in comprehensively complex, yet so totally coherent, that it appears to us as just one process. We live in a very analog, we live a very analog experience. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, again, I think all this requires in, 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 uh, explanation. I've, uh, there's a fellow named Rodner uh, from which I'm taking some of these quotes. And effectively, this talk is about uh, understanding how human beings, we interact with information. Uh, and in that sense, we have to ask what is human cognition? What is information? Uh, and if you go back and say uh, just, uh, well, what are its origins? The Latin origins refer to two uh, fundamental meanings. One is the action of giving a form to something material. The other is the act of communicating knowledge to another person. And again, the trivial meaning is what's in the paper today. Um, to quote Nor Norbert uh, Wiener, he says, information is information, not matter or energy. No materialism, which does not admit this, can survive in the present day. The question is, does he know what information is? I would argue that he does not. Um, and effectively, do, do we know what information is? And effectively, does Google know what information is? Um, so what is this what powerful your ethereal something that resides in CDs, books, sound waves, is acquired by our senses and controls our behavior, sits in the genome, that's what people say, and directs the construction and performance of an organism. It's not the digital pits on the CD, the fonts in the books, uh, the oscillations of air pressure, the configuration of synapses and distribution of neural activity in the brain, or the bases in the DNA molecule. They all express information, but, but they're not the information. Shuffle them around or change their order ever so slightly and you may get nonsense on this or destroy an intended function. Information can take many forms and still mean the same. What counts in the end is what information does, not how it looks or sounds, how much it is or what it, it is made of. Information can take the, form, the same form and mean different things to the same person or to different persons. Information has a purpose, and the purpose is, without exception, to cause some specific change somewhere, sometime. Um, and the, these last the couple of statements I don't necessarily agree with, but the last statement is information may lay dormant or for eons, but it, it is always intended to cause some specific change. Um, and, and here's where it gets interesting. Uh, information always has a source or a sender and a recipient. It must be transmitted one to the other. And for the specific change to occur, a specific physical mechanism must exist and be activated. We usually call this action information processing. Information can be stored and reproduced either in the form of the original pattern or some transformation of it. For the transformation to embody the same information, it must somehow be able to lead to the same intended change in the recipient. Again, I think this last statement is questionable. Um, information may be created, transmitted through space, and preserved or stored throughout time, but it also may be extracted. So some questions. Is information reducible to the laws of physics and chemistry? Does the universe or in its evolution constantly generate new information? Or are information and information processing exclusive attributes of living systems related to the very definition of life? Uh, as you'll see, uh, it, it's true that information is tied to life. And cognition is tied to information and effectively to life. Uh, there is a historical process that has to precede the creation, transmission, preservation, storage, and extraction of information. This historical process I choose to call distributed cognition, or the immanent dialectical relationship between life and information. Um, that's a mouthful. Um, but uh, one interesting thing is that information is physical. 
if, if, if somehow you can identify information, it's always engraved in something. Uh, you could talk about ideas. Information is synonymous with an idea. And ideas are engraved in our neurons. And so it is physical. Um, information causes some specific change somewhere, sometime. Um, the discussion should be about the origin of life and how information came into being as a result. There is an imminent dialectical relationship between life and information. Again, a mouthful. Therefore, there's no purpose to information except in the context of life and cognition. An organism is in constant recursive interaction with information from inception. So from the time that we uh, become living beings, we're one cell, then we are dealing with information. This emphasizes the dynamic nature of life and information. Um, I, I, I've chosen to bring up some principles of dialectics. Dialectics is something that really doesn't get uh, talked about very much, but uh, one uh, aspect is that matter above ab absolute zero is always moving and changing. So change is a constant of life. Uh, if you look at an atom at the zero absolute, nothing moves. Uh, a little above zero absolute, things move. Um, Matter moves and changes in a sequential dynamic of continuous development. Uh, again, uh, that's something that you can, uh, I guess you can experience. Matter moves and changes in a contradictory dynamic of, of continuous development. And then I cite thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Uh, again, uh, what's the, the dynamic of life of, of an apple? Uh, clearly, there's a seed, you plant it, a tree grows, you produce apples, you produce seeds, and then the cycle starts over again. And, and, and again, uh, uh, it's sequential, it's predictable to some extent. Uh, we all are born and we all die. Then the more interesting thing is quantita quantitative changes in moving and changing matter lead to qualitative changes. This might seem counterintuitive, but consider something like water. Um, what, what do you do with it? Let's say it's, it's frozen. You add heat to it, which is the lowest kind of energy that you can add, so quantitatively. Then it becomes water at a certain temperature. The quality is different. Then you, you add more, more heat. Uh, then it, it, it becomes uh, vapor. Uh, an atom, uh, you, you simply add energy to it. The, the, uh, uh, an electron jumps. It goes quantum. And, and of course, you, the same thing is you can remove uh, energy and again, the, the, the electron goes to a lower orbit. Uh, now, what I, what I want to say is th this is the typical way we think about things. Um, and here I define emotion and, and uh, cognitive. And, and sometimes people think they're, they're different. You know, we, we uh, as living beings, uh, uh, well, are naturally emotional. Uh, but, uh, but uh, I guess eventually, uh, but, but, but somehow people look to, uh, to explain emotion differently than, than, uh, than uh, being cognitive or, or being rational. I, I believe that they, they, they come, well, they come from us. They come from the same, uh, um, uh, I guess, source. Uh, Hutchins, uh, he coined the term distributed cognition, and what he was doing is seeking to understand the organization of cognitive systems by observing human activity in the wild. Uh, so, and then he said, well, cognitive process may be distributed. For example, if you are a team here in Google, uh, clearly different members do different things. And uh, so this, this cognition is distributed ac across that social group. Uh, it also, it's distributed in the operation of the cognitive system involves coordination between the internal and external material environment, environmental structure. And finally, through time, in such a way that the products of earlier events can, be, can transform the nature of, of uh, later events. Uh, he has the perspective that somehow, uh, I guess we have emotions and also we're rational. Uh, I don't have that perspective. I think uh, you can find uh, both elements. Uh, 
uh, in in any human being and uh, and again I, my definition of distributed cognition is uh, different and, and and emphasizes this which is the ability of an organism to interact with its environment that's something that we do every day uh, since since uh, I guess we can remember uh, and our purpose in doing that is simply to satisfy our physiological and social needs and something we that really comes later is simply uh, survival and sustaining ourselves so I think what's primary is uh, as we sit here we're breathing if we didn't breathe I mean somehow we, we, we would not be able to to do what we do but that's something that motivates us to, to continue doing what we do uh, and again I, I don't see physiological needs as, as static they tend to develop sometimes you, you develop uh, a, uh, a flavor for a, a Tesla vehicle right again it could be a physiological need if, if you want to view it that way um, and uh, here's uh, the autopoietic uh, homeostatic organism autopoiesis is simply self-production so uh, if you're looking at uh, at an organism interacting with its environment. This is the basic unit of analysis that we should use. So you have the, the, the environment and the organism, it interacts with the environment. Uh, this interaction is, is not, um, is, uh, let me say, um, uh, it goes both ways, but, but it's not symmetrical. Um, now, Eventually, this organism initially it's just a, a uh, it, it just has a protective layer that is a, that that exists in the environment, and of course uh, in, it, it uh, resulted from the environment, and it's really a separation that that uh, that is achieved from the environment, but eventually, of course, it 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 uh, senses the environment in some ways. And, and again, here, you know, I've, I've, uh, you're, you're looking at the five senses that we have, but of course, depending on the organism, uh, you would have uh, different senses. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, we become ideating organisms. And, and here, I want to talk about the PSR view, which is the personal subjective relative view. Each of us is a subjective being so therefore we have a, a unique personal subjective relative perspective of the world we do um, now, now the question is some people say you know if you uh, if you achieve science or scientific thought then then you're totally objective and, and again I'll clarify that in a minute but the question to ask those scientists that think so is how as subjective beings they evolve to being objective beings that's what I would ask them and I, I think if they have a good explanation then uh, I, I think they'll find that it's not so simple um, now if you're looking at this PSR view this personal subjective relative view uh, so what type of behavior should we expect if we're, if we're all alone well I, I would argue that uh, we can think any thought that we want. We can believe anything that we want, right? If we are in the middle of nowhere, okay, that's what we uh, we can believe anything. But what is the one thing we cannot believe? Good answer. But uh, but I would argue that it it's something that will lead us to our demise. That is the thing that we cannot believe, because then we die, and it doesn't matter anymore, right? Um, but we're not alone, right? When we're born, we're born into a community of human beings. Everybody has a mother, so we're always relating uh, to to other uh, human beings, and really, this is the 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 world that that we uh, live in. Now, if you look at any of these two uh, beings, uh, ideating beings, you notice that, of course, the environment is at the bottom, and then there's another being to the side. That can all also be considered as part of the environment, 
right? So, so when we talk about distributed cognition, that definition that I gave you previously also relates to there being other beings other, uh, beside you that are part of your environment. And there's no, uh, really there's no difference between, uh, let's say, inorganic or even animals, plants, and another individual in, in certain ways. Now, as you can see also, there's a PSR view one and there's a PSR view two. You noted there. Now, and I, I and I have some circles that denote the universe that each each individual has. But then uh, there's a shared universe that you need to develop a consensual space if you are going to interact with another individual. And that's always a negotiated space, right? I mean, we're speaking. In, I'm speaking in English, and you understand it. Okay, that's our consensual space. You might not agree with the idea that, that I present, and, and again, we, with, some of the, with some of them you might agree, with some of them you might not agree. And so therefore, there's a shared universe. What that shared universe provides you is, is, uh, is an impersonal, objective, absolute perspective, which is uh, sort of the area of agreement which is, is a little more, well, a little more impersonal. It applies to both of you, right? It's a little more absolute. It, and um, uh, and um, uh, it's a little more objective. And you can argue that science is in that space, right? We make discoveries on a personal basis, but then we share it and agree on things or, or, or on, a, on a consensual basis. But religion is also there. There's an intersubje it's an intersubjective space, right? Uh, and and, and so, so again, here you, you find uh, 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 your agreements with other people, uh, but there, there might be different spheres in which these agreements take place. Of course, it's in, if it's in the scientific sphere, you have to be clear about what that means, right? If it's in the religious sphere, again, you have to be clear what it means. And and the th the thing is that the the let's say the PSR view has to coexist with the IOA view. They coexist, and they develop uh, uh, historically, right? Now the question is, uh, if you look at the 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 in the relations on the sides, do we have this same relationship, let's say, with inorganic matter? Let's say with our iPhone or, or uh, the Google phone. And I would argue that we do. We do develop a consensual space, but it's a consensual space that we dictate. Yet, in the end, we forget that we dictated it. If the sun is our god, Right after a while, we we sacrifice things to that God, but it's not because the, the, somehow we we gain an agreement that the sun has anything to do with it. It's it's a reflection of us in in gaining that perspective. You know, in 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 in, in developing that shared universe. Okay, and sometimes we lose lose track of that. Um, and again, this is a nice uh, picture to sort of emphasize uh, that point, you know, uh, and then you can argue whether those two uh, um, uh, PS, the, the beings with a PSR view one and two are collaborating or not, right? Um, so this talk, I, in general, I said was about defining a basic unit of analysis, which is the autopoietic homostatic organism and its environment that interacts with its environment and cognizes uh, with a purpose to satisfy physiological and social needs. Uh, and this is the personal subjective uh, relative view. And that leads to survival and sustenance, which uh, basically reflects more the impersonal objective absolute view. Um, and the basis for distributed cognition to occur is information. 
Now, it, it's interesting uh, also um, if you start looking at us from uh, from an embryonic perspective, uh, what you find, what you see here is that we one of the there's an embryonic plate that uh, that occurs uh, after conception, and it has three layers. One is the ectoderm, the other one is the mesoderm, and uh, the other one is the endoderm. Uh, initially, it's flat, but then eventually it 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 becomes it coils, right? And the the ectoderm is on the outside. Uh, the uh, endoderm is between our mouth and our anus and all ancillary organs related to that, and then the mesoderm is our bones and our muscles. That's what we are. Now the ectoderm has a an interesting aspect, and that is that. Uh, it, um, it's not only our skin, but it's also our senses, and also and our central nervous system. So clearly there's a direct connection, even uh, from embryology, between our, our senses and, and, and our brain. And, and so again, to, to talk about the, the brain in a jar, I think is a waste of time. You have to get the, the senses involved in some way. Um, now, what, what do all our senses have in common? And again, this is a pictorial view of, of the senses. Well, what they have in common um, is that all sensorial uh, elements end up as, uh, as uh, biochemical and bioelectrical signals to the brain. It doesn't matter where they come from. Uh, it's interesting to note that sight, the smell, and hearing are directly connected to the brain, while touch and taste are indirectly connected to the brain. Uh, maybe that just reflects uh, historically that touch and taste were more primitive uh, senses, and uh, sight, smell, and hearing uh, uh, are more recent. The other thing is uh, sight, smell, and hearing are long distance senses. The other ones are direct senses. Um, so. Uh, Sense substitution is an interesting thing. Can you imagine seeing with your skin? This is a work uh, that was done back in '69, and basically that individual picture there uh, is holding some, uh, uh, basically a matrix of electric uh, electrodes, which uh, he puts them against uh, his skin, and then those are connected to a video camera. And then a person with that equipment in one afternoon could be trained to uh, uh, grab a ball that's going along an incline, and that individual being blind. Okay? Uh, so that tells you a little bit about uh, our senses <laughs> and our brain. And this is another individual. I guess he climbed Mount Everest. You can see the, the video camera that's uh, on his head. And of course, in this case, uh, the sensing or rather the, the transduction, I guess, is done through his tongue, uh, an electrode. Um, so that, you know, that tells you about, uh, uh, I guess, uh, that we, we can be trained in different ways and it doesn't really matter where we get the, the, the electrical signals going into our, our neurons, uh, but we, we, we are sensitive enough that we can accommodate that and, and uh, their sense substitution. Um, so, in summary, the world, with regard to our senses, at least, the world which we inhabit and discover by way of our senses is dynamic, right? Our senses are bombarded with a never-ending barrage of parallel stimuli, which I call sensorial maps. If you put your hand on an object, that's a sensorial map. That, uh, and, I, and again, that sensorial map uh, lasts until uh, a split second later, there's another sensorial map, right? Uh, and again, uh, with regard to these stimuli, uh, they're multi-directional in origin, varying in amplitude and duration, are, and multi-source. Um, you know, the universe consists of spatially and temporally distributed matter and energy. A sensorial map results from the response of our senses to the matter and energy of the universe. A comparison of two sensorial maps separated in space and time leads, leads to a discernment of a difference. In order to get a difference, you really need to compare two things. In our case, these two sensorial maps. 
they lead to a difference. Information or an idea is a different that, that is a difference that makes a difference to a living being. Um, and again, uh, you know, I, I want to go back to sort of the principles of dialectics. Uh, and matter moves and changes in a contradictory dynamic of continuous development. Um, and uh, and and really, uh, we we're assessing differences, and 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 then building on them. Um, to show uh, how that might occur, in this particular case, you, you can see there are two sensory maps, the two yellow, and which end up into an information map. And then in the orange, the, the same thing occurs. And these could be sensorial el elements that are either next to each other uh, or, or, in, uh, in a, or in a sequence of time. Now, of course, you could have many of them. And, and again, this same process occurs. Or, uh, you know, you, could, you can have, uh, I mean, this could be sight, this could be a, a sound, this could be touching, whatever. So, so again, the, the point is that you end up with these information maps of, of the world. Now, and, and then, you know, you can say, okay, here's sensory map A, sensory map B, okay, the information map is the one on the right. Uh, I mean, it could be as simple as that. Now, what if you compare two information maps? Then uh, you, you might get a pattern of some kind. What if you compare two patterns? You can get a meta pattern. As you can see, the, the, it, it can become an exponential process with regard to acquiring information related to your uh, environment. And then, of course, this can go on, right? And, and we can become very sophisticated, uh, uh, I guess, processors of information. Um, So the environment which we inhabit may be characterized as consisting of matter energy expressed as continuously changing and radiating fluxes. Our senses limit the consciousness and unconscious perception and processing of these never-ending and infinitely radiating fluxes of matter and energy, which are multidirectional in origin, varying in amplitude and duration, multi-source. Our senses detect these radiating fluxes of matter and energy as sensorial maps. Sensorial maps reflect the structure of these radiating fluxes of matter and energy. The sense of touch, 2D, 3D sensorial maps occur over our whole body because of the nature of our cutaneous sensors. A comparison of two sensorial maps separated in space and time lead to a discernment of a difference, which is an idea. A difference, an idea that makes a difference is information. Uh, so basically, sensorial maps lead to information maps. Um, Here, uh, I just want to emphasize again, uh, going back uh, to looking at an organism, for you to notice a difference, somehow you have to be motivated to notice it. Uh, if you're in a room uh, or even talking to someone, uh, really what motivates, uh, you can't really absorb everything that's in the room. What motivates you is, is that moment, right? Nothing else. The rest is it, you don't really care about. And, and I argue that uh, physiological and social needs are really what drive your looking for th these differences, for this information that's in the environment. Um, and the, this process oriented toward the discernment of information maps is the learning process. The process of discernment of information maps is the process of learning in the process of learning also leads to the discernment of patterns in our environment. A pattern results from the comparison of at least two information maps in the same way that an information map is the result of the comparison of two sensorial maps. A meta pattern results from the comparisons of at least two patterns, uh, and so on, right? Uh, so basically that's what how we acquire information. Now, the question is, when does it become meaningful? See, it's one thing to, to have a machine that is, is capable of doing this. The question is, well, how do I get meaning out of that? Um, and um, uh, let, let me summarize these, these last, um, uh, well, uh, 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 slides in the following way. Uh, my daughter was recently trying to train uh, uh, 
her uh, little girl to go to the bathroom. And so there's a method whereby uh, you you follow the child for uh, the, during the weekend. And, and as soon as you see them going to the bathroom, you basically you sit them down. And supposedly after a while, they, they get the meaning of what, what one thing means with regard, with regard to the other. This is basically what it's saying, what these things are saying. And that's a result of James Gibson. And he says, ambient information is always, always available. Flow is created by the movement of the observer. Right? The shapes depict the underlying invariant st uh, structure of the optic array. If we move around the room, there are things that remain more or less the same. They remain invariant. Right? And we can say, oh, that's the same. I'm looking at the same thing. Uh, visual perception is panoramic, and over time, the panorama is registered. The conveying of information about the world by ambient light, sound, and odor. Structured distribution of energy in an ambient array that specifies events or aspects of events in the environment. Uh, so, so again, the, the point of, of, of this is uh, that, you know, if you, if you look at something long enough, right, you, you'll find meaning in it especially if it relates to satisfaction of, of, uh, of uh, physiological uh, needs and social needs. Uh, this is just a, a schematic of basically the organism and the environment and, and, and a flow diagram relating of, of, of how uh, uh, sensory data gets, gets processed. Uh, let, me, let me get to information. This uh, Wilkins uh, in the 1600s uh, talked about uh, a difference that makes a difference. I, I won't dwell with it. This is the original uh, uh, book, and this is sort of the translate or the, uh, the uh, just uh, copying what, what he said. Uh, but he talked about, for in general, we must note that whatever is capable of a competent difference, perceptible to any sense whereby to express the cogitation. So he is aware of a difference that makes a, a difference, uh, which is basically what Bateson uh, said. Um, and I guess a more current uh, version of what is information came out of the mathematical theory of communication by Shannon. Um, and he said that the fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point either exactly or approximately a message selected on, on, at another point. Uh, frequently, the messages have meaning, um, but uh, the, the, the semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant to the engineering problem. So he wasn't concerned really with the meaning of a message. He was just concerned with uh, uh, sending uh, uh, or communications. And this is really the, the gist of what he uh, what, what he did. Uh, you know, you have an information source uh, who generates a message, you have a transmitter, you have a signal that uh, where noise is added, uh, you know, through a channel, then the signal is received by a receiver, and then it's is, uh, is sent on to, to a destination, right, after it's transcribed. You can look at um, telegraphy from this perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody writes down a message, gives it to the, to the telegraphist, uh, that person dots and dashes, sends it over the wires, there's noise added to the wire, there's a telegraphist that receives it, writes it down, then hands it over, right? Uh, I mean, so that, that's basically what that is. And this is applicable to any kind of communication, any, any kind of acquisition of information from the environment. This, this applies. Um, and as you can see, this is a, 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 a version of that related to, to that original diagram. And again, that both co bo goes both ways, right? And, and, and again, the same principles apply. Um, uh, let me not dwell too much, uh, but um, let, me, let me just dwell here on, um, on uh, the mathematical theory of communications assumes the ability of an individual to compose a message. Uh, and then, it also assumes the ability of an individual or machine to encode the message, uh, also a machine to transmit the message, or a machine to decode the message, or a machine to interpret the message, which we're seeing now. Uh, and then, um, 
you can do a sort of a self-referencing exercise in where I ask how are these cognitive abilities realized? Indeed, how did we get to where we are now? Um, th this is an application of, of what Shannon did. If, you, if you're looking at just throwing a, a coin, uh, and, and again, the, the, the formula for calculating entropy, which is H, is given there. And depending on the coin tosses and so on, you, you can calculate entropy. This is uh, basically the, the entropy calculation of this is a sentence. And again, you can see that uh, you know, I, I can reorder the, the letters and this is a sentence um, and then calculate the entropy related to that. Uh, so so it's, it's just a mechanical process that, that you can engage uh, in uh, to, to assess the amount of information that anything can have. Um, so, uh, you know, we can ask where do we find ourselves in the communication system as the source of the message, as the encoder of the message, as the messenger that helps transmit the message, as the decoder of the messages, the message as interpreter of the message, and uh, well, you could even argue information is us, right? How do we achieve these roles? Uh, basically, a brain's transition from the state of not knowing to the state of knowing. A brain's transition from not knowing to imagining and the drives and motivations that lead a brain into one transition or the other. Um, so a message is the receptacle of information potential which may or may not be realized. Information potential may be realized by maximizing the amount of possible information given the message structure by including and maximizing meaning. Uh, which is the reason for its existence, which may or may not be realized depending on the living being that's the recipient of said information. Information can realize uh, different levels of meaning, which is a function of content and of interpretation of that content. Um, you know, the content may not have different levels of gibberish or it may, may even require different levels of interpretation on the part of the recipient. For example, the one bit message of yes or no is clear to anyone that receives it, but what is not clear is that what its informational content means. It could be the answer to a marriage proposal or to a business deal, or it could even be an unexpected piece of information that has no meaning. Only the recipient will be clear as to what to make of the information of this message. Another example relates to the message where something might be said or not. To understand the message and information requires learning to have taken place in the context of information gathering and interpretation on the part of the recipient. Here's Shannon um, and uh, at different levels of uh, digitization. Uh, the original image is the 8-bit image um, and then of course you can reduce uh, uh, the amount of information. Uh, this is Shannon again at different levels of um, of, you could say magnification of of, uh, of uh, the area, depending whether it's two pixels or four pixels, or eight pixels, or sixteen up to one hundred and twenty-eight, and you can see what uh, what you can say or not say depending on on what's what's in the image. Again, this is eight bit. Notice that the eight bit image is is clearly uh, tells you a little bit more, informs you more. Um, and again, the exercise that you might go through is simply if you're a if you're a being of some kind, uh, you know, uh, where should you be in terms of your development? Here's another image of Shannon, except that you take the eight bit image and of course then you, you reduce it to one bit along the vertical scale, and then you add uh, either light or well, you either lighten it or darken it along the horizontal scale. And then you calculate the entropy. Turns out that that central image, which is the original image, I mean, the photographer was good enough so, so that it's at the maximum in terms of it, it, its entropy, which, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, and again, if you have lots of information, 8-bit image, uh, again, you, you know you can reduce the information and, uh, and uh, uh, well, at least you can do something with it. Now, if you start with a 1-bit image, nothing really changes. And, and again, you 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 don't you can't gain any more information than what you had to begin with, right? And again, consider it in terms of the context of a living being. W where are you better off? Are you better off uh, having this capability, or are you better off having this capability in terms of, of assessing your environment? Um, 
So uh, basically, uh, I've gone through an introduction. We've looked at the organism in its environment uh, from a cognition perspective and information perspective. Uh, the universe consists of spatially, temporally distributed matter and energy. The world which we inhabit and discover by way of our senses is dynamic. Our senses are bombarded with never-ending barrage of parallel stimuli, uh, which are multi-directional in origin, varying in amplitude and duration, multi-source. A sensorial map results from the response of our senses to this never-ending barrage of parallel stimuli, sensorial maps from the matter and energy of the universe. What motivates our search for these stimuli is our physiological and social needs. A comparison of two sensorial maps separated in space-time leads to a discernment of a difference. Information and idea is a difference that makes a difference to a living being. Uh, two conditions need to be met for information to exist. One is the existence of a detectable difference. And, and again, there are here there are two extremes. If you have matter at absolute zero, uh, you, you have basically no information, right? Uh, then you have a matter as a black body. Uh, that's a one in a binary world, I guess. Uh, I, and again, uh, is there information in, if you just have a white screen? Not really, right? Um, so again, you, you go from one extreme of no information to another extreme of no information. The real world is somewhere in between. Um, a living being being motivated to find, recognize, process, and utilize differences, ideas, inherent to the existence of matter. These are the two conditions that you need to meet for information to exist. Uh, distributed cognition is the ability of an organism to interact with its environment um, for the purpose of satisfying its physiological uh, and social needs to survive and sustain itself. The use of this definition leads us to assert that information is the basis for human cognition. And I would even argue that information, uh, there's no life without information, rather life uh, uh, really from the first time that it came into being, really was dealing with processing information. Um, and so rocks clearly are not alive. And um, well, anyway, uh, thank you for your kind attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. If you have questions, we can pass the mic around. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm a bit um, hazy on, on the aspect of, of universality of this um, idea. Um, it seems to me that it's very anthropocentric. Uh, you're kind of um, shying away from, from talking about what it would mean to a less perceptive uh, living creature, for instance. And I mean, so the title being sort of the universality of this, and if you need a human being or something with those uh, sensitive capabilities to actually define this, how does this go from that to being truly universal? Well, uh, as you can see, there's a exclamation point and, <laughs> and a question mark. Uh, I... Um, Information, well, if you have matter above uh, zero absolute, matter is in motion. Uh, if matter is in motion, there uh, uh, basically uh, there are differences. The question is if we are not there to look at those differences, and by we are not there, I mean any organism, even the most fundamental organism, uh, literally, the information might be there, but we are not there. Uh, now, uh, it's true that this is un uh, it's centered on us. And the reason it's centered on us is because I, I can't, uh, 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 I don't know what a paramecium is thinking, uh, or, or really I would have to study them in detail to know uh, what's going on. But some of these things are, are much applicable, very applicable to any living being. Sure, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about the, the, the need for something alive. It, it kind of makes a duality between alive and not alive that I don't actually think exists. I mean... Um, you're, you're right. And there you have to go to a topic that uh, I didn't cover. And, and, and basically, what the difference is between something that's alive and not alive. 
And many people argue that the line is very fuzzy, right? And and so so again, uh, uh, yes, true. So so I would agree with you that uh, really the line is not there. I mean, people argue talk about emergent properties. I I don't think those. That, I mean, that's not a good thing to argue, because then you're arguing a duality of things with with other words. Uh, one example that that uh, I can give is simply uh, uh, let's say at STP conditions you have uh, oxygen and hydrogen, right? And what are they? They're gases. Now you combine them, you get water. Wow, that's an emergent property, you can say. But it really, is it really? And people talk about human beings or beings that are alive as if somehow there are some emergent properties that uh, qualify us uh, to, to, to be alive. I don't believe that. So again, that sort of goes along with what you say. A very interesting uh, discussion of image scaling. Uh, in astronomy, we often take an image and map that scale of pixel values using a function. It might be histogram equalization. It might be uh, uh, square root mapping. And you made the proposal that um, the image of highest entropy was the one that had the greatest depth of perception. And a, a Gaussian distribution is the distribution that has the highest entropy for a given mean and variance. And so the takeaway I'm getting from this slide here, which is great, is that uh, one should uh, map images using a, a Gaussian transformation to map the original pixel distribution monotonically onto a Gaussian distribution. So that's, um, that's actually an actionable trick uh, I'm going to take away from this. So I wondered if you had experimented with uh, an elaboration of this where you're shifting it by one bit throughout the image to like an image stretch to show what a Gaussian distributed but monotonic grayscale would would look like or what it would be. Uh, no, I have not done that and simply because the, my interest was uh, other than that. Um, uh, here uh, uh, I, I just wanted to see that the interesting to me of the uh, the interesting thing to me of this image was that uh, let, let's say you're, you're you're a developing organism. You know, where do you really, wh where did you start in terms of detecting what's around you? You might have started maybe on the left side of the image or maybe the right side of the image. But then eventually what happens is you have to move up to the that uh, center image uh, there at the top. You know, and interestingly enough, I mean, it's an observation that I've made after the fact is that the photographer must have been very, very good. Because uh, as you can see, that center image, which is the original image that I picked off the internet, is basically the one that has the greatest entropy. That's an idea I can use. Thanks. <laughs> well, we are. Doesn't that always hold? Sorry. Sorry. Huh? Doesn't that always hold? I mean, if you're just doing a linear mapping to hard, to darker, or linear mapping to lighter, uh, sort of the range of things, the distribution, you're not changing it. You're just squashing it, right? So every single image has to be by definition, at its most entropy in this graph? Uh, well, that's not, not what you see here, right? Because you see the entropy falling off on the uh, on the two sides. And again, the extreme is if you add uh, enough white, then you just have white. That, that's right. So so you start at the, at the maximum, and then you, by linearly transforming things, you squash it, right? Um, but it's possible that I mean, what, what if the photographer was not very good and he gave you a dark image or a light image? And then uh, as, as you added light on dark, maybe the image gets better. How can you get more information? So it depends on the mapping. Certainly some mappings would would do that, right? So some, right. some nonlinear mappings would stretch the range to, to other things and by linear, whatever, something. Uh, but... Um, if it's a, I don't. Well, okay. So it, it depends on the on the darkening and lightening yeah, algorithm. Because let's say you you start out with the with the one image from this from the edge, and then you add uh, either lighten or darken, 
the center is not going to be at the center of the image. It's, go it's going to be shifted, right? I'll, I'll calculate it and see how that works. So we are out of time. We'll do a, it's a pertinent announcement. We do have lunch in Big Table if we want to continue the dialogue uh, with Dr. Uh, Cardenas Garcia. But thank you very much for uh, being here with us tonight and sharing uh, some of your work. Thank you. Oh, thank you.